And I believe that uh, the situation in the world uh, is not improving. Uh, it's uh, more worsening and therefore there should be a particular effort uh, with experiences that one is bringing from uh, the realities of uh, uh, what is happening in uh, our planet and uh, Mohamed Sanun is, I think, uh, the right person to animate everybody in this sense. First of all, he has uh, this uh, conscience of the responsibility to be able to uh, influence uh, a team. Secondly, he has uh, the experience uh, and the skill of a diplomat, both multilateral and bilateral diplomat, coming from a developing countries. He has also the experience of uh, having been a political prisoner and tortured uh, uh, during uh, the Algerian war. And he will also have the sensibility for people suffering and that uh, there is a need to act in order that uh, this uh, uh, protection would be realized. And finally, I think, uh, uh, let me mention the experience of Mohamed Sanun in Africa, as an African, in these uh, last 10 years, where he was with the Secretary General of the United Nations, dealing with a number of situations where he was the mediator, the intermediary, and also the advisor of the highest responsible personality in international cooperation, Kofi Annan, uh, in what should be made for Africa. Therefore, I'm so confident that uh, for CO, for uh, initiatives of change, uh, we have the right president, and I thank Mohamed uh, that he has taken this responsibility. <laughs> Many thanks. Thank you so much, Kofi. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good friend, as you said. Yeah. What are the most important qualities of a peacemaker? There are a couple of, I would say, essential uh, qualities. One of them is uh, certainly uh, to be conscious of the heavy responsibility and not undertake this responsibility if you don't prepare yourself for it. And uh, you prepare for yourself for it, first of all, in trying to know as much as you can about the issues. When I was asked to, to go and mediate in Somalia, the first thing I did is to call friends at the Uppsala Institute in Sweden and ask them, please, can you convene a meeting of the best experts on Somalia? So they were, they were kind enough to bring four five actually professors who come and for two days I listened to them I noted understanding how the Somali clan situation work the sociological situation in Somalia and so on which made me aware of in a sense why the current conflict are going on what are the historical links and so on so I think the issue of knowledge is extremely important and then the need to look into oneself and what is really needed, what, what quality, what kind of instrument, what kind of dimension I should, I should be using. A very important element is the need to be patient and to listen. You need to listen carefully to the people you are mediating between and uh, not only listen to them and uh, taking note of it, but really showing that you are interested in how they perceive the thing, not in what they tell you in terms of, uh, in terms of elements of uh, the history of the uh, situation, but how they are affected personally. And you ask questions exactly in that direction. Mm -hmm. If they, they see you asking questions which go do, deep into their own being into their own soul, they trust you. They say, oh, he's really trying to understand. He's understanding me. He knows 
my problem. If you say, oh, okay, okay, I know that, I know that. I've read uh, books about that and so on. People don't trust you anymore mm -hmm. because they feel that you have listened. And they go to their groups and say, oh, this mediator is already uh, won by our adversary. He's, he's not listening to, to, to us. So that's extremely important to listen, to be patient. What do you see as your greatest achievement in your career? I would say uh, the possibility to be uh, there when needed to avoid that uh, suffering, that uh, humanitarian suffering uh, would uh, continue and would have a terrible impact which then would be extremely difficult to, to heal because that once the, uh, the wounds have really worked into the memory of people, they, will come, they can be there for generations. Mm -hmm. And we have seen it, seen it in other situations. For instance, in Northern Ireland, when you think of how people up to very recently were still continuing to fight each other, not because they were confronted by immediate problem, but very much because of the wounds of memory. Uh, unfortunately, the international community is not yet totally conscious of their, its responsibility and the need to really support whatever, uh, whatever progress we make in mediating conflicts and therefore consolidating what has been had. You can make peace. You can even keep peace, as we say, the United Nations for for a certain time, but we need to build the root peace in the, in the country's concern. And that rooting of the peace is not done. It needs resources, it needs understanding, it needs support. And very often some of the countries who are plagued with these conflicts are considered not a priority in the international agenda. Job being a Muslim from the Islamic perspective, uh, I'm really interested in knowing how important do you think is the spiritual di dimension to peace building in Islam? Uh, you have to really believe that there is a possibility to, to do something, not because you are clever, but because there is something in you which is a spiritual strength which can help you. And that is come from the fact that you have maybe had an education uh, in taking into account the spiritual dimension of your being and not thinking that it's only with your intellect and with your knowledge and uh, with your cleverness that you realize that. You have to realize that you have to often meditate and try to find within yourself enough strength to when even you are practically in a situation of despairing of a situation that you should not give up. That kind of uh, source of uh, spirituality is extremely important. What inspired you to accept the role of president of IOC International? Well, <clears throat> I've been invited a couple of times and especially to a dialogue between religions. It was such a really deep discussion that I, I realized that it was not something you hear in a, in a university <laughs> without, of course, uh, underestimating the importance of what the debate which goes on in the Learning Institute. But I thought people were really discussing, in a sense, with their full being, with their, with their understanding spiritually and intellectually of what they were talking about. So I thought it was, in a sense, a movement which had a dimension which I did not find elsewhere. When my good friend Cornelius Omaruga asked me to succeed him, uh, and after, of course, a long discussion about what that implies, uh, and uh, he convinced me, and I accepted. What is your vision for Co? Well, uh, my vision is uh, the, the one of my predecessors is that we 
in a sense, continue in the legacy of Frank Buchmann, to have that kind of intimacy with ourselves and with each other, which allow us to know better how to resolve uh, our problems in this world. We should bring the people who deal with global issues to come to co where we ha deal with intimacy, because the two of them have to, to be linked. And then these uh, leaders, these people who, le who deal with global issues might use that kind of dimension more in the future and help us consolidate peace and uh, build peace in the world. Because we have to realize that uh, this last century has been one of the bloodiest in uh, human history. We have two world wars, a cold war, and all their consequences. And uh, it's as if humanity had not learned from ages of, of history. So we uh, need to do something. We need to use our that specific characteristic, which is spirituality and also the art of listening, of understanding, to be able to go, uh, convince those who are dealing with global issues uh, to be more uh, consequent. This needs time. Uh, time is very, very important. And, uh, we need to first share these ideas, see to it that uh, people know exactly what we are aiming at, and, uh, and gradually bring those who are more open to this to come and join us here, so that together with them, with these people who are more open, make an appeal to other leaders. So uh, we'd, we would like to have uh, uh, first to prepare for next year, in 2008, or summer 2008, to have that first meeting, uh, which will then really uh, draw the agenda in a sense of uh, a process which will continue after that. What do you think are the really great advantages of co we can, to some extent, make people who come here who are dealing with global issues to feel relaxed. They are not here coming here to argue with each other or to defend some kind of specific interest they have. We want them to come here and just feel relaxed and talking as pure human beings, talking to other human beings like themselves and communicating with each other and saying to themselves the same question, what can we do to make peace? Not what can you do or what can I do, but what can we do together? We are together. Peace is in our interest. How can we work together uh, as, as, as really brothers and sisters? We seem still to be going on. The war seems still to be going on. We have it in Iraq, we have it in Afghanistan, we have it in the Middle East. We have crisis in Latin America, in some parts of Asia. We have even tension today between Russia and the uh, United States on the missile issues we have between Russia and the UK. So uh, we, we can find ourselves in, 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 uh, again in a war. We, we need to be conscious of that. What can we do to avoid a new catastrophe? Uh, what can we do to already help the people who are suffering today from these local wars to, uh, to get out of that? Yes, we should indeed, for instance, see to it that we uh, enhance global, uh, good governance in the countries which have uh, been left behind. Uh, and it's not their fault. They, there is a legacy, there are many, all kinds of legacies, uh, the, the colonial legacy, the Cold War legacy. Uh, how can we help them to, uh, to, to somehow overcome these legacies? So people will then asking, responding together, not arguing with each other. So that's what makes CO in a sense different. So when you say people who come to CO, uh, who do you mention? Who are they? Well, uh, I mean, you've mentioned the peace practitioners. Yes. Are there, are there 
Well, in, 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 in sense, first of all, uh, I think we need, to, uh, as I said earlier, we need to bring some political leaders because we want them to listen. We want some political leaders. I don't want to give names, but to give maybe one name which comes to our, to my mind, Nelson Mandela, for instance. Mm. He's not anymore in charge. That doesn't mean necessarily that they are still in charge, but they have been political leaders. They have shown to humanity their wisdom and their ability to overcome big differences and be, uh, actually, I was uh, a mediator with Nelson Mandela. We, we were working together uh, on, on the Congo. Yeah, I was representing the United Nations, and I myself asked that we should ask Nelson Mandela to come and help us. Mm. And Nelson Mandela came, and we were able to start a negotiation between the former President Mobutu and the, uh, and, uh, and the one who was taking over Kabila and trying to avoid the humanitarian catastrophe. So Nelson Mandela impressed me very much when I, as we were working together. So I, I would see that some of those guests for Art Co in dealing with this peace issue should be leaders who have that kind of impact. I would add to the political leaders, uh, we need some people who have some kind of uh, thinking, of knowledge of of what the, uh, our history is, of what we human beings are, some important philosophers or some of the men of, of thought. Hmm. I would add also some religious leaders. Hmm. You can see very well the Dalai Lama coming, for instance, here, hmm. and uh, speaking about his own conviction and the process he feels that uh, can be used in order to communicate better. I would then see the civil society, mm. some important institution of the civil society who have a, a good experience of working for peace mm. and therefore having studied all issues on human rights, on the problem of security, human security. Mm. This is very important because I consider that a root cause of the conflict is human insecurity. So people who have thought about that, who have analyzed this, this and who already have done also something about that, bring them here and all of them having an exchange here. That's how I see the different categories of the mm -hmm. participants to the, uh, this call for peace. Would there be a role for also uh, other groups like um, young professionals, um, uh, artists, um, oh, yes. even entertainment people, celebrities at, at some stage, uh, people that could uh, get the word out through through the media or get the attention of um, Absolutely. more wide, wider audiences. Absolutely. When I say civil society, I include uh, I include definitely these categories of people. Uh, we need to be able to build trust. Uh, and to build trust between the people who are there, the politicians, the religious leaders, the thinkers, and so on. It's good that we have, uh, for instance, some people who can show through art, through music, how we can build trust. We can build trust through art, through music, through communication. So we need people, indeed, who would come here and help us create that kind of intimacy I was talking about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. intimacy between people who deal with global issues. So we definitely need some artists to speak about their art and to show their art at the same time and to show how a, uh, their inner being has been able to make them uh, understand our environment. And I think especially also of people who are dealing with the degradation of the environment, people who are dealing with sustainable development, who can speak about these issues, who can talk about these issues, I would ask even somebody like Al Gore to be here if, if possible. Uh, but I have been a member of the Brundtland Commission uh, together with a number of leaders and that Brundtland Commission uh, was the one which coined the concept of sustainable development. I also have been a member of the Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty together with my good friend Cornelius Omaruga. And that commission 
has coined the concept of the responsibility to protect. And I think that should be really a key issue. What are we doing to protect uh, people who are practically threatened by annihilation, by starvation, and so on? What are we doing or by, by uh, bad governance and corruption? What are we doing to help these people? The responsibility to protect should be a key issue to be discussed by these people. But again, with, with serenity, with openness, uh, not coming to fight each other, but really understanding that they are responsible, that it would be responsible, that history will, will judge them on, on their behavior. So that, in, and we don't have to finger, to point our fingers to them, but they have to sense that by themselves. They have to read it in themselves and, and express it the way they want. I wonder how you see the role of the um, entrepreneurial community in, in uh, creating jobs, creating the environment for peace in, in, uh, in these conflict situations in Africa. The role of the business community is absolutely essential and the role of economy, of course, in general, is essential. It's important, of course, to alert people to the fact that even if a, a government, if a le political leaders in Africa happen to be able to achieve good governance, and there are a number of them today in Africa who have established good governance in Africa, I think of Mali, I think of Ghana, I think of Tanzania, I think, who have been able to, to establish good governance. But if they don't resolve the economic problem in their countries, they will be challenged by their own people who would uh, tell them we elected you, but what have you delivered? And sometimes they, have not, they are not able to deliver because the economic situation has not been uh, handled well internationally, mm. not only nationally, but internationally. Because for instance, if you take a country like Mali, which produce cotton, they cannot sell their cotton in the international market because the cotton from, from developed countries is subsidized. And therefore, the price of the cotton coming from developed countries might be less than the price of the cotton which they themselves have to, to export. So how can they compete? So we have to have that and had the business community themselves be advocate of, for an, an, another kind of economic relation in the world. What's the vision you have for young people who, who are part of IOC? I thought I uh, we, we did with that. <laughs> <You did. laughs> no, but I'm, that was the overall vision for IRC. I was very interested in the young people who are part of IRC. What vision do you have for them? Because a lot of people who have come to Co, uh, yeah. their perspective on life has really changed. And when they go back down the mountain, uh, how do they keep that spirit alive in the real world? Uh, really, I uh, great, great expectation from the role of the youth. Well, I think young people are still very open and open to change, open to change in themselves, open to change around them. And I think uh, especially uh, those young people who come to Co and realize exactly that, they realize that in a sense they have a mission. In a sense they have, uh, uh, because of their youth, because of their openness, because uh, uh, they uh, can uh, change things and or, or they can also avoid to, to be trapped into some of the problems where others have already been trapped. You can, they can overcome that. There is something which is in the discussion you have, in the exchange you have between your youth and looking at the others and listening to the others and who, who can, if they are sincere enough, express the consequences of their hang-ups and of some of the problems they have had. So the youth can be alerted and avoid that. And I think they can bring a fantastic message of, of hope. We need, we need that kind of hope. We have not used very much the term hope, but it's very important. And I think the youth is, are, in a sense, our, our hope for the future. Thank you very much for answering this question. I'm really grateful. Have a nice day too. Thank you, you too.